Please turn to 1 Timothy 3. Really an awesome chapter in its uh, breadth of context and content. One of the more challenging studies that we could ever face concerning elders and deacons and the church, which is the pillar and ground of truth. I wish from this moment on, if you've been guilty of referring to a building as the church, that you'd desist. In no concept of New Testament Christianity is it proper to refer to a building of any kind anywhere or a cathedral as a church. The church is the bulwark of truth, the pillar and ground of truth, 1 Timothy 3.15. We exist to disseminate, to teach, to share the Word of God. We're to be known above all else as a people, whether we meet in a house or a barn, a rented hall, under a brush arbor, as brethren used two years ago. Uh, wherever we meet, we're the church. The building is just where the church meets, whatever kind of building it is. In fact, we read two or three times in the New Testament, the church that is in your house, referring in the book of Philemon and elsewhere, 1 Corinthians 16, to brethren who met in some brother's house. And so as uh, Priscilla and Aquila and Paul were fellow tent makers, and it was in their home that uh, the church met, then that was not a fancy cathedral or a building, an edifice, but a people, wherever they met. And the church of our Lord is the bulwark, the pillar and ground of truth. First Timothy 3.15, Christ purchased the church with his own blood, must be very important and essential, Acts 20.28. 20, and Christ is the head of the body, the church, that in all things he might have the preeminence, Colossians 1.18. Now that's one of the major statements in the whole book of First Timothy. Remember the five main points, the qualifications of elders, preach the word, keep the church pure, live as an example, rebuke false teachers. And the bulwark of truth, the church, keep the church pure, is one of the main uh, theses of this uh, great book. Now we come today to what is controversial again, not because the Bible is, but because men have perverted what the Bible says or are unacquainted with it. And we sort of run roughshod over the matter of qualified elders. How important are the elders? In Old Testament days, the elders or shepherds are rebuked sternly in Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 34 because they took care of themselves but not the flock that was under their care and guidance. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 17 says, Elders watch for our souls as those who will give an account in the day of judgment. How can you be more seriously involved than that? Give an account for the souls under your jurisdiction or leadership. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Know them and esteem them highly in love's sake that are over you. So there couldn't be anything more important. In Acts chapter 20, as Paul called the elders of Ephesus to the seacoast village of Miletus for a farewell address, he said, Take heed unto yourself and your teaching. Continue in them, for in so doing thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Elders are referred to as shepherds. And Jesus is a good shepherd. And he guides them with the integrity of his heart and the skillfulness of his hands. Psalm 78, 72, John chapter 10. So when you have any uh, similarity between the good shepherd, the shepherd and bishop of our souls, as Christ is called in 1 Peter 2, 25, you have an awesome responsibility. You have a most serious work that transcends earth and even goes into heavenly portals. So when we speak of elders, and when 1 Timothy 3 does, he begins by saying, this is a faithful saying. This is verily, verily worthy of your consideration. This is truth, absolute truth. If a man desires the work or an office of a bishop, he desires a good work. And so the various names given to elders, presbyters, and we'll read of how the presbyters laid their hands on Timothy, and we'll get to that in the next chapter, and also in the first chapter of 2 Timothy. Uh, they're called shepherds, bishops, elders, presbyters, overseers. All of those speak of a different view of what elders' work is, and it's always serious and sublime and challenging and divinely appointed. So this has to be a serious matter. And for us to bypass what the Bible teaches on uh, the eldership is to really be cowardly. So we hope today to just teach what the Bible says about elders and deacons. There is a great misnomer, especially about deacons. I've heard, brethren, through the years, I grew up hearing this and believing it until I studied for myself, 
that elders oversee the spiritual work of the church and deacons oversee the physical work of the church. That is not so. The very original word translated deacon proves they're not over anything. They have special work to do, which the elders under which they serve appoint them. But usually this is based upon a misunderstanding of Acts 6, where seven men were selected to take care of the Grecian widows in the daily administration of benevolence. There was complaints among those who had who were Jewish, but they had uh, Greek education and lived perhaps in Greek areas. And so uh, they felt that since they were not true line Jews, but had adopted sort of the culture of the Greeks, that they were being misused and overlooked in the daily benevolent work. And so the apostles said, it's not good for us to leave the preaching of the word to serve tables, but he challenged the church there to search out among them and select men who would do this work. And what was it? Serving tables, helping in benevolence. They weren't overseeing that, they were helping in it. In fact, the Greek word diakonos, from which we get servant, minister, deacon, is all derived from that one word. And the context will show you what he's speaking of. I want you to listen real carefully to this. If those men were deacons, notice the considerations. The qualifications for them and the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 are totally different. It's strange that here he's speaking specifically of deacons in the church of the Lord, and he gives specific qualifications. They're not at all like those in Acts 6. And also, the only way you could use Acts 6 for, quote, deacons, would be they're appointed for a certain special work, and when that work is over, they're through as deacons. Because shortly thereafter, both Philip and Stephen are no longer doing that. They're out preaching the gospel. And so deacons do not oversee anything. Elders oversee the work of the Lord. They will then use these special servants qualified under the qualifications given in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 to serve under the oversight of the elders. In fact, the word diakonos had an definite expression under roar they rode under the authority or the leadership of the elders or whoever was in charge now this is a very important point you don't have to be a deacon to serve the lord you don't have to be a deacon to go to heaven but to be a deacon in the bible sense you've got to meet these qualifications so don't ever use again act six as an example of deacons for if they were then you have a different qualification list and their work only lasted until the work they were appointed to do was taken care of. We need to appreciate that. But we'll get to that in a moment. Let's start with the elders. This is a faithful saying, a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire the good work, not an office like with a nice desk and a few chairs where you put, put your feet up on the table and boast of a leadership role. It's a work, a serious work. He desire the good work. A man ought to back off and uh, say, do I really want to do this? Am I willing to live up to the challenge of being an elder in the church of the Lord? It's the most serious work on the face of this earth. No president, no king ever had his high responsibility as elders in the church of the Lord. Their work transcends this life. They give answer for our souls in the day of judgment. No wonder we should pray for them fervently and respect them highly. But when we get into a popularity voting contest, you put your man in and I'll put mine in, sort of run it like a labor union, uh, that isn't New Testament Christianity. But if a man doesn't want to be an elder, don't twist his arm and push him into that work when he doesn't really desire it. It is not something for your name to be on the letterhead of the stationery of a congregation. It's a daily 24-hour-a-day task, responsibility, privilege, honor, but not of earthly honor. It has to do with eternal bliss. A bishop then or an elder must be blameless. Someone says, I eliminated three or four fellows whose names came up because they made a mistake in 1938 and I was there when they did it. Peter was an elder, 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4. He calls himself that under inspiration. And yet Paul rebuked him to his face for he was to be blamed. Galatians 2, 11 through 14. So blameless doesn't mean never having made a mistake. Jesus is the only one that did that. He couldn't be an elder because he wasn't married and didn't have children. 
The word blameless means if you are blamed for something you've done, but you make it right, then you're blameless. Peter was an elder, and yet he was rebuked to his face for he was to be blamed. As over serious matters concerning faith and morals, if you please. Galatians 2, 11 through 14, but he made it right. So the word blameless doesn't mean what a lot of people think it does, and if it did, then we couldn't ever have any elders. The husband of one wife, and that literally from the original language means a one woman man, a one wife man. The question comes up, well, suppose a man is appointed an elder and his wife dies and he marries again. Now listen carefully. You don't have to be an elder to serve God. You don't have to be an elder to go to heaven, but you have to have these qualifications to be a Bible elder. I believe this one woman, man, means that if his wife dies, he marries again, he should not be an elder. There must be a reason for this express statement, husband of one wife, a one woman, man. I've known of people who were elders, their wife died, they married again, and they even married out of the Lord. Do you think the congregation that appointed him to be an elder wants him to be an elder now? When he's married, a woman's not even a member of the body of Christ. Or he marries a shallow woman that doesn't meet the qualifications of the wives of these men that we'll read about too. There's a reason this is here. In the first century, one reason was adultery was as natural as breathing. So many great specific statements are made about proper marriages in 1 Corinthians 7 and Romans chapter 7. The point is to be an elder, you've got to be exemplary. There can't be a question mark around your situation. Husband of one wife. Vigilant, that means ever watchful, but you can't be careful to watch if you don't know what you're watching for. I once guarded a bonfire, what was going to be a bonfire on the campus of the school where I was attending, and I thought, what am I going to do if those people come over here to set it on fire? Uh, I wasn't uh, really wanting to sit out there in that cold West Texas wind anyway. The point is, vigilant means always ready. Be vigilant. Be sober. Your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, 8. So you've got to always be on guard. But a man that doesn't know the Bible can't guard against false doctrine. He can't fight the devil because he knows the devil better than he knows the Lord. He's so worldly. There's specific reasons. Sober, that means of a sober disposition. Not flippant, giddy, foolish, silly. Of good behavior. Given to hospitality, he is one who helps others. I don't believe that that means what some people say, that you've got to have your house wide open and 37 people a week sit at your table. You can be hospitable by giving money to the poor, taking food to the poor, helping those who are in need, taking someone in the store and buying them a suit of clothes. Uh, hospitality is a spirit, an attitude. Apt to teach, and that means skilled in teaching. There's one Greek word translated three words in English, apt to teach, and in the original language it means skilled in teaching. A skilled teacher. He knows the book. He knows the Lord. He knows men. He knew what was in man, John 2.25. He is skilled in teaching. That eliminates a lot of good men who can go to heaven, but they shouldn't be elders because they're not skilled in teaching. I've known some men who were elders that couldn't teach a Bible class, much less a neighbor or teach from the pulpit. Uh, he wasn't skilled in teaching. Good old boy, friendly person, loved the truth, but didn't know enough of it to teach it well. Or if he did, he wasn't a good, skilled teacher. I believe there is the area that we're hurting the most in. How can a man guard the church of the Lord if he doesn't know the enemy and doesn't know false doctrine and doesn't know the truth of the Bible to refute error? It's a serious matter. And that's why it's difficult to find qualified men today to be elders in the Bible sense of the word because we've wasted so many years not studying the Bible in depth. One reason we have so many men who are elders that aren't skilled in teaching is they wait until they're about 35 years old to get interested in studying anything. They didn't like to read. They didn't like to study. They didn't like to be taught. They ran from it. They wouldn't... Uh, Spend the time it took to learn the book. And in a Bible class when they were younger, they were silly, writing notes instead of taking notes. And so we're going to have to start all over with a new generation and build into them these qualifications. Very, very important. Not given to wine. In the next uh, passage, when he talks of deacons, he said not given to much wine. And people say, see, a deacon can drink socially, but he's not to be... A bibber, he's not to have his head in the bottle all the time. 
Well, not given to wine. I know what that means. Not given to much wine. 1 Peter 4.4 4 says we're not to be excessive in rioting. You mean I can riot, but not excessively? We remove the overflowing of wickedness from our life. James 1, 21 and 22. Can we have a little bit of wickedness in our life, but just so it doesn't overflow? It's just the way the Bible reads and the way the language was used. But actually it means this, not given to much wine about the deacons. <clears throat> in the first century, and we can prove it with another passage in 1 Timothy, we don't even have to step into history to prove it. But the water system in that part of the world was very bad and people had stomach trouble of all kinds. Timothy... Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake, and you're off to infirmities. You know the only way you can apply that today? Your name would have to be Timothy. You'd be about 2,000 years old. You'd quit drinking water. You'd use only a little wine, and then for your stomach's sake. only way you could use 1 Timothy 5.23. Direct instructions to one man and the reason back of it. The point is, what they'd do is they'd take one little bit of water, and they'd filter it through three-fourths of wine or the other way around. One little bit of wine and three parts of water. It wasn't much wine. So he's simply saying you're not to be a wine bibber. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And he's deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs 20. And then Proverbs 23, 29 says, Who has woes whose eyes are bloodshot? Those who drink wine. There are many passages that bring this out. But there's another passage that says abstain from all appearance of evil. And you ask the highway patrolman where 50 to 60 percent of all deaths on the highway occur and why they'll say they're drinking of alcoholic beverages. How can we abstain from all appearance of evil and keep ourselves pure? 1 Thessalonians 5.22 and 1 Timothy 5.22 by even getting near the stuff. But again, you've got to understand the background, the context, and what he's saying there. Leave that alone. It cannot be helpful to you. Not given to wine, no striker, and that means someone that is easily provoked and uh, has always got his fist doubled up, always a chip on his shoulder. Not greedy, a filthy lucre, referring to money. And so that eliminates a lot of men who spend so much time, as many hours a day as they can, making more money. Covetousness is idolatry, Colossians 3, 5. And so someone that spends so much time on uh, making of money having nicer houses, nicer clothes, nicer cars, nicer this, nicer that. They don't have time to study. They're not enamored by Bible study. They're enamored by material gain. But patient, and that would be a very difficult uh, thing to perfect in order to be an elder, because there's nothing that takes more patience than dealing with brethren who are rebellious. But patient, not a brawler. He doesn't have a quick temper. That eliminates a lot of men I've known who are elders. Elders in the sense that men call them, but not the Bible. They have a short fuse. They have a terrible temper. Uh, they just, uh, that's just them. And so uh, they need to wait until they get themselves under control. And men who are like that really know they are. When they back off and see the trouble they cause at home, at work, and in the community, they realize they're not qualified to be an elder. If you ever needed patience... Uh, it's as an elder, those who watch for souls. For you see, brethren doing so many foolish things. Not covetous. We need to understand that covetous is an inordinate desire for material things. The rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he had great riches. Mark chapter 10. Jesus looked on him and loved him. Mark 10 says. Something level about him, but he loved money, things, stuff, junk. More than spiritual matters, so he went away sorrowful. One that ruleth well his own house, a man who's henpecked, a man who almost jumps and salutes every time his wife speaks, uh, can't be an elder. A man who's intimidated by his own children, and that's happening more and more in America. I never cease to be amazed at how some young people talk to their parents and how parents allow it. Having his children in subjection with all gravity, and now we've hit on one of the most controversial points of all, and I'll prove it in a hurry. Now, every time a congregation is going to select elders, they say, well, who has a plurality of offspring? Does he know the book? I didn't the first question. Does he love the Lord? Does he prove that he's a patient person? Uh, does he have a plurality of offspring? Have I got news for you? The word children in the Bible is not plural. 
It's neutral. I can prove it in a hurry. I used to hold the other view because that's what I've been taught. I believe we've kept some great godly men out of the eldership that ought to have been in a long time ago because we misunderstood this point and magnified it <clears throat> to such a degree if he has a plurality of offspring, get him in there. Who would have thought that Sarah would give, ch uh, would, uh, give nurture to children, give suck to children, Genesis 21, 9. How many offspring does she have? One. But children, Genesis 21, 9. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. If I'm an only child, am I excused from that? I don't have to obey my parents because I'm an only child. First Timothy 5. Children and grandchildren take care of their parents and grandparents. Or they're worse than infidel. If I'm an only child, does that excuse me from responsibility of my parents and grandparents? In the Bible, the word children is used in a general way and we've just proved it. I can prove it right here. If I were to say everyone in this auditorium at this time with children leave. If you had one offspring, would you just sit there? That doesn't apply to me, he said children. Even our use of the language, much less the Bible's use, proves in the Bible it's a general term. I've heard people say, but it takes more depth and intensity and wisdom and all if you have more than one. I don't even believe that. I've been told and I've observed that the most difficult th thing in the world is to raise an only child. Sometimes then rather than carry it further. Well, it'd be better if he's going to have children, he ought to have one girl and one boy because then he can understand both groups. Well, why don't we have two sons and two daughters and we never end on that story. What does the Bible say? That's where we've got to put our peg down. And I believe I've proved from the Scripture that the Scriptures use this word in a general way. And so uh, it's a serious matter, and we can't overlook it. But they're to be in subjection with all gravity, and that eliminates a lot of men whose children are not even close to being in subjection. They're disobedient, flagrantly disobedient. They talk back to their parents. They almost use profanity in talking to them. And the father is not the head of his house, like the Bible tells him to be. He's not in charge of his children. They scare him. We live in that kind of a world. But when it comes to the serious nature of those who oversee the flock of God, we can't skimp in any measure, and we can't cut back or overlook, eliminate, turn a deaf ear and a blind eye. For, verse 5, if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Here are the children of God. He's to oversee, and he can't even oversee his own household. You better get things in order there. But we overlook so many of these things. We've been programmed to do that. But we're going to have to be honest with the Word of God. And I wouldn't be honest today if I skipped over these things or soft-pedaled them. And I know as I teach this, a lot of what I've said is controversial. All you can do is search the Scriptures, not your emotions and not your background and not what you've been fed all your life, but search the Scriptures to see if these things be so. Acts 17, 11. I don't claim to be right, but I know the Bible's right. And to the best of my ability, after research and study, I've told you what I believe the Bible says. That doesn't make it so. But it doesn't make it not so just because you won't study it out or have an open heart to think. Or somebody's got to teach what he believes it says. I am dumb, but I'm smart enough to know it doesn't please everybody. But for 52 years, I've been a gospel preacher. You're not going to scare me off of that. I can be wrong, but the Bible isn't wrong. And I've taught what I really believe is right. Well, does this mean that uh, after a man's children have gone into the world for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, that if I were an elder, I would still be answerable for their actions? That is the all-time dumbest thing I've ever heard. Because the Bible says each one should give account of himself for the deeds done in his own body. I have a 48-year-old son. Am I still answerable for him? Somewhere along the line, he's going to answer for himself. While he was in my home, was he a faithful Christian? Yes. Did he strive to do what was right? I believe so. But he's been away from home now for 31 years. God's the perfect father. But he had 23,000 children of his own that fell in one day. Numbers 21, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 12. Did it break his heart when they went astray? Read Psalm 78. 
Read Jeremiah 13. Both God and the prophet Jeremiah wept over the apostasy of God's people that caused them to go into Babylonian captivity. Was God responsible for that? Somewhere along the line, a person gives account for himself. If I were an elder and my son had left the house 10 or 15 years, 20 years, and he went astray, would that grieve me? It grieved me so much, I wouldn't be an elder anymore. But am I going to tell other men they've got to resign? No way. Not because of that. If while they were under his jurisdiction, answerable to him, they were faithful. So I think a lot of times we forget he's saying here are the qualifications when you appoint a person. If they met those qualifications at the time of their appointment, what a son did 30 years later wouldn't rebuke that. So we need to be fair with what the Bible says about judgment. And uh, sometimes we hold a standard so high that no human being on earth could ever be an elder. The other extreme is just vote them in, bring them in. But let me tell you a little secret, and I'll say it one more time. Bible elders are not elected by popular vote. They're selected by divine mandate that's been in the Bible 2,000 years. I even hear brethren say, we elected some new elders the other day. Well, if you did, it wasn't the New Testament church. You don't elect men by popular vote. You select them by divine mandate placed in the book. Very, very serious matter. Now, what I urge you to do and what I must do, and that's keep searching the scriptures. Don't check on what a congregation where some of your kinfolks are did or what happened where you were a member. It's a serious matter. Someone says, but we've got to have elders. No, we don't. We've got to have qualified elders. A congregation exists without an eldership. But if they have one, it must be scriptural. We need to back up. Now, there's something wrong with a congregation that's existed for very many years that doesn't have qualified elders. And something wrong with the teaching program and the intensity of faithfulness among those that were elected instead of selected. But we don't have to have elders. We do have to have qualified elders when we have elders. It's better to be scripturally unorganized than unscripturally organized. Now, young man, I'm going to talk to you again. Now, listen to me. Don't let your mind wander. Focus in on what we're saying. I've just challenged you to get yourself qualified so that when the time comes that you're of age, you will be mature, spiritual, dedicated, committed, loyal, it won't happen overnight. You won't wake up someday and say, whoopee, I'm an elder. You ought to work toward it, build toward it. And parents, you need to think of that. Therefore, young men, marry a devoted Christian because her life will affect this matter too. The reason some good men aren't elders is they don't have good wives in the Bible sense. Some of them even have wives that wouldn't be an elder's wife if you'd pay them $12 a minute. They don't like responsibility, not spiritual responsibility. They might be the head of the PTA and the uh, community chest and a few other things, but they don't want to be the wife of an elder. That's way too serious for them. So one of our problems is we don't prepare. Now notice what he says in verse 6, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Pride is the snare of the devil. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before fall, Proverbs 16, 18. I weep for you over your pride, Jeremiah 13, verses 15 and 17. There isn't anything worse than human pride. So you don't appoint a novice, someone that's not prepared. True story. In Corpus Christi, Texas, about uh, 35 years ago, a man who was a young man, still in his 20s, was the head coach of an unseemly, unlikely state championship football team smallest school in his district, never had won anything, but he was a motivator. And he won the state championship against a school five times his size, the Wichita Falls Coyotes, who were a plague of the West for several years. And in the state finals, he won the state championship. He became an immediate hero. He was promoted in his athletic career. And finally, Lubbock invited him to one of the choice spots in Texas to be the head over all the athletics in the Lubbock school system, 29 years old. But the brethren there in Corpus appoint him an elder, not because he's qualified. Good old boy, cheerful, great personality, successful in his work. That was a downfall of that fellow. He couldn't take it. He shouldn't have taken it in the first place. 
but then he couldn't take the fame that went along with his work. The last time I heard about him, and as some time ago, when he and I once were personal friends, close friends, he and his wife hardly ever attended services. But he was an elder at age 29. No way in 17 that he could have been. And his subsequent life proved it. So we ought to stop and think about this uh, pride, the snare of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. In other words, business people in this community will have to recognize the fact that he really did live up to what he claimed. If I see that clock right, uh, what does it say about 1020? Then I've got to save the rest for tonight. So we'll start with 1 Timothy 3.8. Uh, if you think what we said is controversial, just wait till we get to this. And then in chapter 4, we'll go as far as we can and then finish that Wednesday night. We're trying to cover these books in order in every chapter and every verse and every theme. And I hope that we've said some things that will stimulate study. Is it wrong to have high ideals? Well, if it is, we better throw the Bible out. It says come up higher, launch out deeper. Go beyond what you've ever done before. That's what the Bible teaches so we need to study, pray, prepare. And one of these days we'll find congregations that are really what they ought to be. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for the challenge of Christianity. It's high demands. We pray that we may in a practical, down-to-earth, honest way approach its grand teachings and determine right now we're going to change the next generation and that we're going to do better than we've done in the past that we're going to think on a Bible level and not compromise or shy away from that which is so demanding. Help us to realize how important it is and how imperative it is to keep the church of our Lord pure in organization, in teaching, in life, that we might convey and portray to the world about us a high ideal that tells us to do better than we've ever done before. Bless men who are Bible elders wherever they are who meet the qualifications and live the life of shepherds guiding a flock. Help us to so live as to make our lives everything they ought to be, lest we be unqualified members of the body of Christ. But help us all to determine that from this moment on, we can be counted on to stand up for Jesus. In his holy name we pray. Amen. We now extend the Lord's invitation. If you're not a member of the church, which we've already Noted as the pillar and ground of truth, you need to come to that truth, embrace it, obey it, and be baptized into Christ under the remission of past sins that he, the Lord, might add you to his church. Acts 2.47. Won't you come as we stand and sing?